Shubh Sandhya. Good evening. Ah, good. <laughs> good. <laughs> Filling the hole. There is a big kind of vortex over there. Nobody. Oh, Nina G. Ah, <laughs> very good. Um, so I thought I, I, I will try to consider uh, the requests that I've received today. And these requests revolved around a little bit of uh, my own stories, how this all came to be, and also how to integrate this path into daily life. We're getting closer to go home. Tomorrow is the last full day. Um, and uh, I'll be talking a bit about the Eightfold Path, but this is a special sutta where the Buddha explains it in a way that um, all of this is supported by what we do in everything that, uh, in every aspect of our life, basically. And so this is not just a path of sitting meditation, but it also has its roots very deeply in every corners of our life. So, and then rewind to um, eight, nine years ago in 2014. Uh, it's not going very well in my life. <laughs> and I'm uh, really wondering what I'm meant to be doing on this planet and uh, really not knowing and um, I am uh, pretty much a mess. Uh, my mind is a mess as well. And I am looking for happiness and love in others, which brings uh, me hurt and other people hurt as well, unfortunately. Um, not knowing this beautiful path that I do know now. <laughs> And um, this quest brings me to search for answers. Uh, I am at the bottom of my well. I think I pretty much uh, lost everything in my life. Difficult breakups. Uh, I left my family behind. I have, I feel like I have nothing left basically in this world. Yay. <laughs> so, um, I'll try to keep it light. <laughs> it's actually going really well. Um, anyways, uh, sometimes you just need these things to happen to you in life uh, for things to get uh, a lot better and start over a uh, full, clean, beautiful, sparkling white slate. <laughs> and so basically what happens uh, starting to try to meditate and understand what does it mean uh, to uh, have a spiritual practice, try to find meaning in life. I'm from an atheist family who uh, I wasn't brought up with any kind of spiritual understanding, uh, no God particularly. Uh, just uh, science and kind of like a believe what, whatever you feel like you want to believe in, which is great, but uh, it's also kind of like, hmm, <laughs> I don't know, <laughs> I don't know what to believe in. So, um, and this kind of understanding is, is very nice, it's very open and it's very kind of gives you a lot of options, but it also doesn't show you a lot of, um, a lot of options, I guess, a lot of, gives you a lot of choice. Uh, and it kind of feels empty as well. It feels like uh, all my life I was like, okay, so I'm just doing this and at the end of my life I'm just going to die and that's going to be it. And I don't know, like it feels a bit <laughs> feels kind of stale. Um, so starting to investigate that a little bit and uh, discovering uh, interesting pathways. I'm not going to go into all of the, those, but... Um, well, at one point, uh, one of my friends goes to a Vipassana 10-day retreat and I decide to go. And I remember sitting on my bed, it was like day six, and I just see this like beautiful light 
uh, streaming into my room and just like hitting my my face and uh, I'm meditating on the bed and I'm like yeah this is what I want to be doing with my life uh, and that's the first time in my whole life that I have this uh, this realization that comes to me uh, all my life I was always kind of wondering what am I gonna do with my life and uh, I never had the answer to that and sitting on my bed in in this retreat um, I just like it became clear I was like this is what I want to be doing but I'm in Canada and this retreat is gonna end in four days and uh, what do I do after? I don't know. <laughs> so you, you, can, you, you can do uh, sign up for these retreats uh, as much as you want, but then uh, there's, there's not a lot of examples of how to do this where I'm from. So uh, it takes me, takes me quite a while. But I definitely had a beginning, an introduction to meditation. I knew a little bit more what to do with my mind than just sitting and making a mason jar of uh, peppermint tea and listening to binaural beat meditation and, and uh, sitting on my cushion. So that, <laughs> that was like my first meditation experiences. And so I have a bit more of an idea how to meditate, uh, but it's a one-pointed concentration practice. and. Um, as I um, move along, um, I tried different also uh, practices, approaches, read, uh, I basically, uh, at some point, I was uh, driving down the West Coast, because uh, that's what I used to do pretty much every year for three or four years. And I would drive down the West Coast from British Columbia to uh, California, and then um, and then that year I basically was house sitting a really beautiful place in California uh, for two three months by myself, which became a personal retreat. And that's where I started to read the Bhagavad Gita, and. Uh, meditated and I was like a, really like a, like a, I don't know like you would imagine like a rishis do like with my little table and like I would just like sit and meditate and read the Gita basically and um, and go through my own forgiveness journey and um, reading about the awakening of the feminine energy on the planet and the earth's kundalini <laughs> so very esoteric stuff and um, I'm all in to go meditate in the, on the pyramids in uh, Mexico and that's what I want to be doing at that point um, and awaken the earth's kundalini that's that's my mission <laughs> so <laughs> however that that happens and um, <laughs> so through that, uh, I'm uh, basically my introduction to loving kindness meditation is through different uh, spiritual traditions. Uh, one of them is the Gita, uh, chanting uh, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Rama Hare Hare, <laughs> the Maha Mantra, and uh, feeling love for God, which is everywhere, all the time, in everybody, every plant, everything that is everywhere. So that's how I start loving kindness meditation, <laughs> and uh, these these are all really interesting understandings that came through. But um, fast forward, I go down to Mexico, and uh, I get basically I am brought in this place. I don't know how I get there. It's called Tepoztlan, uh, another kind of a small Mexican town where um, I don't really know what I'm doing. I'm with my car, I'm living out of my car and uh, meditating in the beautiful places in nature, in national parks uh, all along the US. Uh, I do like a four day retreat in Joshua Tree by myself, uh, meditating amongst the boulders and um, canyons and redwood forests and uh, these are the places I was looking for and Tepoztlan was another place like that of 
quite amazing natural beauty, but I'm kind of lost and um, I go up in the mountains and um, I used to do these um, medicine wheel uh, ceremonies where I would place, I was uh, really into uh, Native American spirituality also, so I would do place my rocks and my crystals and my feathers <laughs> in the, 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 all the directions and uh, have some prayers and meditation, ask for guidance and all these things. <laughs> and so I go in the mountains in Mexico uh, and uh, I ask for guidance, I do my little ritual as I always do. I had like a specific prayer that I would just like recite and ask for guidance. And uh, I meditate there for about like four hours and I walk down the mountain after having like asked like just please help me universe, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> And I come down and uh, I meet my um, medicine man who just happens to be guiding someone in, uh, in the mountains there. And he invites me to his place where I will learn uh, Temascal um, sweat lodge, Mexican sweat lodge ceremonies for the next two months, um, which was a really amazing experience as well. Um, I guess I want to, uh, to say that during this time, not having a really strong background in the virtues, when I came upon uh, this particular Vipassana teaching, uh, just upholding the virtues and then reading uh, the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali and reading um, about the benefits of holding good sila, good virtue, and I could actually see that by not harming any living beings, like beings actually would come to me, like animals and uh, squirrels would just like come on my lap and birds and things like that. And I noticed a shift in their behavior as well where uh, they were not scared of me and uh, because I took the vow of not hurting living beings. And so I started to incrementally notice the power of virtue basically uh, in my life as not like a commandment that's put upon you but as something that is nourishing and beautiful and really uh, bringing you so much basically by upholding those and um, uh, of course, like uh, not, not taking anything that's not given. Also, I saw so much benefit from that and my mind became so beautiful and clear just doing that. So that was a, a really beautiful process to see unfolding. Um, and of course, uh, truthful speech was also quite a revelation to me. Uh, so being from the background I was from, uh, not really, you know, it wasn't a bad background at all. It was a really good background, but not having a particular, you know, set of rules by which to uh, follow your life. And so that was a huge revelation to me. And my life became so much better just following the virtues. Uh, and don't worry, I'll piece it all up at the end with the path. And that's kind of like my... Um, I guess more like organic introduction to, <laughs> to a more like a sutta reading afterwards. Um, but one thing that uh, is kind of what I, uh, I'm trying to move towards uh, recounting this is that uh, there are different ways of working with the mind and there are different uh, states of the mind that can be achieved and there are different ways of achieving those and uh, there are many kinds of samadhis, the many kinds of ways that the mind can be collected and unified. One of them is through uh, one-pointed concentration and I've practiced those quite, uh, quite, quite a bit. Uh, 
but my understanding when I was serving long term at a at a vipassana center, uh, I was basically um, doing a sit and serve program where uh, I was a long term server for uh, maybe four or five months, and. Uh, uh, I know a few a few skills, so I can uh, I can uh, <laughs> I know how to to uh, operate a chainsaw. I know how to build things. Um, I know how to cook. So people like me get really used a lot when they go to centers like that. <laughs> so so I was kept very well busy. Like oh, you know how to drive tractors, huh? Okay, like we got some dirt to carry over there. And uh, yeah, so, and then I ended up as a kitchen manager, a big center cooking for 200 people, uh, 10 days in, 10 days out. So uh, new people coming in every, every basically 10 days, two 10 days per month. Uh, and um, a, maybe 14 servers coming in every time and you have to show them everything again because they're new, they've never done it or they might have done it once. And we're like cooking with these like pots that are like this big and like paddles basically like stirring everything. And so I would sit a course and then the deal is like you sit one course and then you serve like three basically. So that's the deal. <laughs> and then you can, as you serve, you, you go in and with everybody that's doing the course and you basically you sit with the teachers and then you, you can go and sit uh, as much as you want, well, when you're not serving. But I, I noticed that this kind of samadhi or this kind of mental uh, unity that was pretty much uh, forced all the time, uh, is really, really, really hard to maintain in your daily life. I would go back to the kitchen and then, you know, uh, yeah, here, this is how you cut cabbage. And then, okay, here, this is how you wash dishes. And, oh, this is where it goes. And, oh, the food truck is here. And so in one day after, I, I would do a 10-day retreat. And then the first day, all of it was gone when I was back in the kitchen and uh, I was like, okay, so what am I doing this for? <laughs> um, and the more you do it, then the more you're like, I really need to do it more. Cause I like, I mean, this is what it is. Like, this is all you know. So basically you just, okay, like everything is a distraction. I just have to go back to the cushion and like, I really need to like, put my head into that one point and like that's it or just really like spend a lot of time doing that and it's really hard to maintain I mean if you're doing this one point of concentration and you're trying to wash dishes for example uh, <laughs> it's like it's very 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 hard to maintain so I got quite disenchanted with this and um, so I kept on the lookout and that was not just the only uh, practice. I also served in like a monastery in Georgia for, uh, for quite a while. And uh, I was doing concentration practices to there, which was like this uh, Pa'ok style uh, teaching, which is the Visuddhimagga, the jhanas, absorption, concentration. I studied that for quite a bit. I read Pa'ok's books and Pa'ok Sayadaw memorized the Visuddhimagga, so obviously that's what he teaches. And uh, I have a lot of respect to that tradition because they, they do uphold really amazing vinya, good virtue. And that's what inspired me in a lot of ways to become a monk. But again, the meditation was you know, very hard to maintain into daily activities and daily life. And I noticed my mind was getting more and more cramped more and more rigid and I was I, it was better than before in some ways because my mind it wasn't just like woo <laughs> uh, we were talking about uh, many tracks playing in the mind uh, all at once it's like uh, uh, there's a way you can like uh, overlap two two bits of uh, 
tracks or whatever, but then uh, after a few of them, it's, uh, it's just noise. <laughs> uh, like music. Or actual musical songs. Ah. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm not sure if I want to go too deep into this, but... Uh, but it was part of the meditation? No, 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 no. It's just an example. Because <laughs> it came today, and I actually, uh, yeah, I, I'm not sure if I want... wasn't sure if I wanted to mention this, that I was a DJ also, but... <laughs> <laughs> So there's the, you, you can, you can add, like, mix two tracks together, but then if you have like 10 of them and it's not the same beat per minute, you know, it's just a lot of noise. And so, <laughs> and that's not really fun. And I, I wasn't going to say that. <laughs> it, it's really what happens in the mind, you know, when you, you, you actually like start a lot of, songs in the mind you have a lot of tracks playing and it's all like different beats and it's just overlapping each other and you don't know how to turn them off and you're not turning them off i mean this kind of mind is like really painful to live with <laughs> uh, and i really know this very well because i was listening to music all the time and i was always listening to new new songs you know, what was coming up and what was next and like how can i make this transition or whatever. Anyways, so lots of dukkha. I'm very glad I'm not doing this anymore. <laughs> it was a very uh, interesting, fun part as well, but uh, yeah. Um, I played guitar for 15 years and, you know, music was always a very big part of my life, so I guess I have to say that. And uh, but I also, that, is, that was another understanding of, you know, uh, sensory engagement for me uh, was very strong with music because obviously I really love music. I was listening to music all the time, but there was always a track playing in my mind. And uh, when you have always something going on in your mind, it's really tiresome. And you don't know better, like you don't know the silence behind, which is so relieving and blissful, and you can rest there. And the more you listen to and want to hear more, uh, the coarser the mind becomes and the more you need it. So basically, that's how it works with each of the senses. I mean, you can listen to music, it's a beautiful thing. Uh, I'm not saying anything against that. I'm just sharing my, my own experience. Uh, and then this one-pointed concentration, um, it was better than like having my mind going all over the place. And uh, basically, when, when we indulge in all the senses, it kind of creates this agitation in the mind where like the mind is... Uh, it's like echo basically you're gonna like want this and then like it stays in your mind as well so it has an imprint on your mind um, so it was a bit more still a bit more clear a bit more present but there was a lot of tension and I was very judgmental as well uh, like I started wanting my family to meditate like well you should meditate you know like this is like what are you doing? You're not meditating, you know? <laughs> like, I know better than everybody else, basically. And that was not really wholesome. Um, that uh, I am still paying for that up to this day because uh, I tried to put something on my family which uh, was not done very skillfully. And uh, now that I know a lot better <laughs> and uh, uh, that... Um, they could experience a really beautiful meditation. Uh, I've wrecked it in the past. So they're, they're very careful with what I'm saying now. <laughs> they're like, yeah, right. Like he's just going through another phase or whatever. Like, so slowly it's starting to build again. But uh, my, mom is, my mom and I started to practice this uh, twim together, actually. Uh, so 
but they, they've become a little bit careful about, uh, yeah, because my mind was really harsh. It was really judgmental. It was really like, uh, like firm and like uh, obsessive basically about, you know, how, how it should be and how, you know, like you should hold the virtues, you know, like that's, you know, <laughs> that's the last thing you want to say to someone for them to follow the virtues. And um, so, uh, having a taste of that kind of concentration, um, there was a lot of tension in my mind and it was a little bit better than before, but, you know, it wasn't a miracle uh, pill at all. Uh, there was a lot of uh, things that were still not going very well. And, okay, going, coming back to my uh, West Coast story where I'm kind of like finding my way uh, here and there, California, Mexico, uh, meditating on top of Teotihuacan, which is an experience that we both have in common. That's right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that's interesting. Uh, Teotihuacan is like the biggest uh, pyramid in, uh, in Mexico, basically. Uh, the Alley of the Dead. It, it's a bit like the Egyptian, but smaller. A little bit smaller. Anyways, and so um, this medicine man that I encountered in uh, this, this very special place, which just happened to be uh, the sweat lodge um, capital of Mexico, <laughs> um, showed me how to, uh, to do these. And by the way, these were completely clean. There was no mental uh, mind altering substances involved. Um, but he was a herbologist and he, we would boil this massive, um, uh, well, it was basically a garbage can <laughs> full of water. And he would put like the, like a, about like 14 to 15 different kinds of plants, like a native Mexican plants, like camphor and peppermint and uh, lavender and all these amazing uh, medicinal plants. Uh, into that boiling pot of water and then uh, we would heat up the rocks volcanic rocks they would become like really like red hot like iron red hot and um, in Canada and you the US usually like uh, these tents are kind of like a, like a deer skin or they would be like a tarp or like a plastic or whatever it is like a fin but in Mexico it's like a an oven <laughs> they make it so that it's like uh, these um, uh, terra, whatever, like these uh, big, how, what's it called? Terra, like earth bricks, basically. Same thing as like a bread oven. Uh, terracotta. Yeah, terracotta. I'm not sure. Anyways, big domes, and it's really hot in there, and it stays hot for a long time. And so I experienced these, and he would make like this uh, paste that we would just like rub on our joints, and it was like really like a whole, like, everything comes out of you, basically. It's just like all the tension you ever had is like <laughs> melted. <laughs> Um, and we do that for like three, three and a half, four hours uh, sessions. Uh, basically going in there and uh, pouring in, he would like toss in the rocks and uh, the mixture that the tea that we made in just, just before entering, that's what we pour on the rocks basically. And that's what we just like breathe and the pores all open up and it goes basically like right through you. Uh, and this, like my whole body was just, you know, like completely like, like a spaghetti. <laughs> and um, I would come out of these, uh, these sessions and my mind was uh, clearer and calmer than a 10 day Vipassana retreat. Uh, it was really amazing to, it gets so hot in there that you have to let go of everything. Like even thinking is just way too much. It's like you can't, you can't think. At, at a certain point, it's so hot 
if you were to think, you would just like freak out, basically. You just like, you just lose it because it's too much. It's just way too much for the nervous system and everything. So you just have to let it all go. And that's like the, the space where, that's how you get to the release at, in this particular kind of uh, methodology. And so that was a, like a, my introduction. So I said the Bhagavad Gita was like my introduction to the, the metta. <laughs> And then this was my introduction to the, like, the real relaxed step, I guess. <laughs> Pretty intense. <laughs> so from there, um, yeah, I just, um, and this actually, this experience to me was um, in terms of like a meditation experience and like the quality of the mind afterwards, uh, it was much more marked. It marked me much more than my previous experience meditating, like uh, Vipassana and all that, because it was like I was completely uh, tension-free, basically. It was just something I'd never experienced before. And my mind was just like completely blank, like just completely blank. Uh, and it was just so peaceful and quiet and enjoyable, blissful. Uh, so that was another thing that I experienced, which my mind became kind of like, a, it was a kind of mental unity, I guess, because it's not, it's just there. And it's like this kind of oh, like pure awareness. But again, this is, um, this is hard to get back to. Uh, how do you get back to you? <laughs> you need... You need an oven, <laughs> and you need like volcanic rocks, and then you need all these herbs which just grow in Mexico. And I mean, I did those ceremonies by myself in Canada because I was really hooked. Like I was, I was really enjoying what it did to my mind. That's for sure. Um, but it was really complicated, you know. Like it takes a lot of energy and effort, and then you have to make a fire. It takes like four hours, and the rocks have to be like really hot. It has to be the right kind of rocks. I had rocks like exploding on me, basically. Like, I was like, it, this is crazy. Like, like, I'm just telling you right now. Like, uh, shards, like, just like slicing me, like, I don't know, like bacon grease. Like, it was just like going like right through my skin. Like, yeah, don't do that. <laughs> and I was told afterwards that this is because there's some water in the rocks, like it was close to a lake and there was some water and when you heat them, uh, they just like blow up basically. And so just letting you know, if you're going to try this, don't, don't do that. I got some pretty nice scars uh, out of this. Um, but yeah, and then I was realizing more and more, well, you know, this is like, this is a lot of work, you know? <laughs> and it's not like you can do that everywhere, uh, as much as I really enjoy those, uh, those experiences. And the thing is, uh, so how do you maintain that? Like, how does this, like, remain with you all the time? It's a... Uh, it felt really beautiful and wonderful on the moment when it worked very well, but then afterwards it was like a, a kind of like a, like a let down basically. It's like, okay, so, so now what? And then I would just like come back to the meditation I knew, one point in this. And so this was kind of like my mental universe uh, at that point. And this, this sutta that, uh, this is my, my introduction <laughs> to, to uh, this really amazing sutta, which I discovered later. Um, to me, on this path, it took me a long time. Like, I heard about the Eightfold Path uh, many times, and it didn't really click in until much later uh, when I started re uh, understanding wholesome mental development and how it worked, right effort, with Bhante Vimalaramsi showing me all these things. And um, because when I was practicing one-pointed concentrations, I, I couldn't see, you know, like, yeah, virtue was life-changing, life-enhancing, uh, but you can pinpoint your awareness on anything. You don't really need virtue for that. 
uh, you can just force it and that's, there you go, you know, so. Uh, and it, it never pieced together, like when I was reading Right Effort, I was like, yeah, but how does it tie in with what I am practicing? So tonight, I, I think I'd like to offer um, this very special sutta, which is the great 40 states, the Maha Chattari Sakka Sutta. And I think to my, to my understanding, this is one of the best suttas out there uh, to explain the whole Eightfold Path and how it works. 